international organization partners, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants. Uh, would like to welcome you to this FAO Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Dominique Durgeon and I'm the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva and I will uh, try to moderate uh, today's uh, event. This is the fifth uh, Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks uh, event of 2022. And I would like to flag that this series is co-organized with the FAO uh, Market and Trade Division. Uh, our objective is to share information on new development topics at the intersection of trade and, uh, and uh, agriculture. We have a series of events planned uh, throughout the year. I would like to thank you for taking the time to attend our meeting today, uh, given that it is a, a very busy time and there is even a, a meeting of the Committee on Agriculture. And this is very busy, especially uh, in view of the upcoming uh, WTO uh, 12th ministerial uh, meeting, which is scheduled to take place in uh, 10 days from now. So we, agree, we greatly appreciate your support and interest in FAO's work and uh, are appreciative of your participation in today's event. Uh, by now, you must all be experts in Zoom meeting, but allow me to share some details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual session. Uh, you are invited, as always, to update your name and organization uh, by clicking on the dots that appear in the right-hand corner of the box where your own personal video stream appears and select uh, rename. The webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will be later available on our uh, website, along with the various related resources and PowerPoint presentation that will be used uh, today. Uh, the event is scheduled to last for one hour, one hour and a half. And we have reserved some time toward the end of the webinar for comment and intervention. If you wish to intervene, please let us know uh, using the Q&A module and not the uh, chat box. Uh, so that's all for the housekeeping. And I would like to take a moment to present uh, FAO's work, uh, today's topic, and our speakers. Uh, as you may know, FAO supports members' efforts to formulate trade policies that are conducive to improved food security by strengthening evidence and analysis providing capacity development and facilitating a neutral dialogue away from the negotiating tables. In this spirit, the FAO uh, in Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks are based on a, what we call a three eyes approach, informal, interactive, and inspirational. Today's topic is digital tools for agri-food trade, taking stock of progress and key issues for adoption. This topic closely relates to the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, which, as you know, entered into force in February 2017. Bureaucratic delays and red tape pose a burden for moving goods across borders for traders. Uh, trade facilitation, which is a simplification, modernization, and harmonization of export and import processes, has therefore emerged as an important issue for the world trading system. The system is important for trading goods in general, but it is crucial for trade in agricultural products in particular. Agricultural products, as you know, are often perishable and could also be crucial to ensure adequate and nutritious uh, food to consumers around the world. If trade in agricultural product it simplifies and handles expeditiously, food waste can be avoided. In turn, the value chain becomes more efficient and profitable for the private sector. So there are only good arguments for implementing trade facilitation measures in the agri-food value chain and adopt digital tools. Our presenters today will provide further details and suggest policy options for how these tools can be implemented. First, we have our colleague Misha Tripoli, who is an economist in the Market and Trade Division at FAO headquarters in Rome. Prior to joining the Market and Trade Division, Misha uh, worked in the FAO Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia in Budapest, and as an economist in the United Nations World Food Program. 
He holds both master's and bachelor of degrees from Clark University in Massachusetts, uh, US. Uh, we will then have Ms. Nelly Ajus, the, who is the, the director of uh, trade policy and business development at, at Freshfeld Europe, the European Fruit and Vegetable Association. Since 2020, she is further leading in parallel something called SHAFE, the Southern Hemisphere Association of Fresh Fruit Exporters, which represents the nine leading trade associations of Southern Hemisphere fruit producing countries. She further works as consultant and trainer on market access and capacity building projects for the International Trade Center. Ms. Ajou holds a postgraduate master degree from the College of Europe in European Interdisciplinary Studies, as well as a master degree from the Goethe University in Frankfurt in political science and media. We then have Mr. Craig, Craig Atkinson, who is the founder and director of Lex Merca International Trade, a consultant uh, who has been working also as a consultant, who is working also as a consultant with the United Nations International Trade Center and who is a fellow with the Stanford Vienna Transatlantic Trade Technology Law Forum. Before joining the UN in 2012, Craig began his career in commercial diplomacy with the Australian uh, Trade Commission and the Canadian uh, Trade Commissioner Service. He also served as a consultant for the Commonwealth Secretariat and in the private sector. So after this rather long introduction, apologies, we'll now hear from our colleague Misha. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, please post any question in the Q&A module and we'll pass your question to the, to the presenters so that they can uh, react. So thank you very much. And uh, Misha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dominique. Let me just share my screen. All right, I think. My presentation should be should be accessible. Thanks again so much for the opportunity to to be here today. As mentioned, I'm coming from the FAO headquarters at the Markets and Trade Division, where over the last you know four to five years or so, we've been looking specifically at the role of digital technologies in uh, facilitating trade. And so today, um, I would like to share some of uh, some some ongoing research that we're doing. Um, which quite frankly, we, we often come and look at the, the idea really came from looking at the, the role, uh, the opportunity of, of digital trade facilitation and thought to take a step um, back and look at um, really how countries are progressing and, and, and what types of steps countries can take to, to start scaling some of these measures up. So today I'll just be speaking very briefly about um, outlining the challenges and, and talking about a, a very at a high level some of the, the solutions and focusing a bit on the uh, progress and and some steps for uh, for scaling up so I start with the challenges just because I'm, I'm a firm believer in making sure that that uh, solutions uh, address a challenge and so I think it's a good place to start just very quickly to sort of set the context um, before doing that, I, I, I also think it's important to just to just to highlight the the importance of, of trade as a contributor to food security and all really all four dimensions, as probably most of us that are attending this already know. But it's important to highlight both in terms of certainly on the availability side, but also on the access side in terms of uh, its role in, in as a source of helping to generate farm incomes. Um, Moving on to point two, um, we often hear when we talk about uh, digital trade tra digital trade facilitation and trade in general is is the high cost, right? Costs we hear quite a, quite a bit, and really, quite frankly, we have um, a changing landscape where we have a changing landscape where we have lower tariffs um, and 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 higher and higher costs from non tariff measures. So, let's see if I can. Remove this. Okay, there you go. Um, many of which are rooted from, um, let's say, uh, m many of which are related to to how information and data are, are shared. And so this is the first point. And so in building off that, you know, oftentimes we hear about how trade is 
lacks some efficiency, transparency, and traceability. And this is because trade is 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 a really a complex. The trade transaction is is a complex process, right? You have numerous entities involved. You have um, traditionally, you know, a, a number of paper documents that have to be um, recycled and duplicated as they're passed from one entity to another, one party to the other. Oftentimes, clearances are done by by humans. So, so there's there's a number of redundancies in this process. Um, and secondly, is that it, we, there, traceability is a key issue. Oftentimes, it's, it, it exists. It, sometimes it's in, insufficient. And, and many times, we lack an, uh, an audible production history for food safety and sustainability criteria. And really, all these dimensions are really all, really, are, are all, all data problems, right? And so how can digital technologies help address this, these underlying problems? Well, well, trade, a lot of trade, apart from moving the physical good, is about data information. And, and that data information helps protect human, plant, and animal health, our, our, our relevance in at the agri-food sector, which we're obviously talking about, ensuring that product quality and helping facilitate trade. And, and really, on a basic level, digital technologies can help digitalize and automate uh, the, the collection, the analysis, and the exchange of that, of that data uh, throughout the chain and, and through trade processes. And so now just very briefly, gonna just talk about um, three main um, sub, through, three main groups uh, of, of types of solutions. And the first is traceability systems, really essential for, for, for trade, particularly for all, tra all, all agri-food trade, but particularly for livestock trade, where it's often a determinant of accessing global markets. And too, many, and, and too often we see that in some cases they, they're lacking, missing, in many parts of the world, either in paper nor or electronic format. So this is an this is an important issue, and, and and digital technologies provide really, I think, great opportunity. And so there's many different ways of different types of underlying technologies that can be used to create such a system. Um, but ultimately, the key is to store that data, it, it, the, that data and those records electronically. And so this here is an example uh, of a um, of a digital supply chain. That was is is meant to be uh, uh, really meant to optimize traceability and, and 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 really make it the most efficient supply chain possible. And I'll talk just very briefly about what that what that means. So it's a it's a supply chain that a digital supply chain where you can record, store, share, monitor, and analyze data all different data points in the chain. Um, so as the product moves across the chain. Um, uh, the product attributes are collected and stored and provides that trace, uh, the traceable transaction history on how that product was produced and how it was cared for throughout the, throughout the process. You have um, an underlying um, uh, the shared database or database that's used to exchange that information um, where, where, where actors can register that data that's collected, whether it's from handheld devices, uh, IoT, devices, other, you know, remote sensing, what have you, it can be done in many different ways in varying degrees of technology, but it, 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 it can be used to populate, um, you know, it can be used to, to, to populate um, trade documents uh, as well as uh, um, help with regulatory compliance, as well as consumer awareness. And so on the bottom here, you have uh, data analysis, which you can use predictive analytics to be able to optimize farm output or farm management, um, as well as monitoring tools for things like disease outbreaks, uh, fraud, non-compliance with food sta standards. And so you have this automated reports that, um, that are produced based on the data that's collected. And so this is just, this is a bit far reaching, but just to give the idea of the potential uh, and, and something that, 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 that I think it's an uh, important contributor is traceability systems. Moving on, much of the innovation in digital trade uh, trade facilitation lies with electronic documents and, and those exchange systems. So e-certification and, and electronic docs improve the efficiency by eliminating paper, reducing fraud, enabling faster border, border procedures, all of which help reduce costs. That's the idea. And so here you have Two different examples, eFido, uh, which I think probably we're all, all familiar with, um, electronic phytosanitary certificates. You have here a centralized uh, 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 um, exchange system where you have 
importing and exporting countries using their own systems that connect with the hub and you can send information um, back and forth. Here on the right hand side, you have uh, something that's more set up as a shared or distributed um, um, ledger, a blockchain where you have all the different actors um, participating, uh, having the same transaction history, which is advantageous, particularly for automation when, you, when you'd like to use smart contracts for, you know, and, and think, automating things like payments and approvals and so on. So third, third group is digital trade services. Quite a, work, a lot of work has been done on, on digital trade finance. Um, again, very similar, similarly, most often times we see that using blockchain provides that single ledger where, where it can auto execute the settle of payments in real time upon the delivery of goods, uh, which is quite beneficial for, for producers and sellers, uh, helping to free up um, cash flow and working capital for, uh, and helping them better manage their business. Here you have two of the, the um, main types of trade finance, open account and letters of agreement, which overall just moving to a digital system really helps reduce uh, the time of, of doing clearing that paperwork, doing that paperwork from, from, from weeks to, to a matter of days or hours. I won't go into too more detail because than that, happy to talk about that in the discussion a little bit more if it's of interest. Um, but ultimately it, it, it helps reduce the transaction costs, reduce the payment, the length of payment terms and, and helps um, Exporters save money, but also enables lenders to, to supply more trade finance to, to those that, that are underserved. And, and lastly is, is electronic cargo booking, uh, quite an interesting area. This is two examples, two companies, not just, 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 to, just to flag them really as, as, as interesting innovations that, that are ongoing that, that can really help make the, the, the transpor transportation management much more efficient and transparent which brings uh, obviously efficiencies throughout the chain. So how much progress has been made? Here, we're looking at the United Nations Global Digital and Sustainable Trade Facilitation Survey. This, is a, this data comes from respondents so from uh, government officials, covers up to 58 trade facilitation measures. And here we'll be looking at one of the groups, which has two subgroups. And the first is on paperless trade, right? And this, is, this data is from 2021. And so you can see that, <clears throat> This, this is looking at, you know, the, how, what, at what stage implementation is in. You can see the different colors here on the bottom. Um, so you can see quite interestingly that the greatest progress is made with automated custom systems and electronic um, submission of uh, customs declarations as well as internet connection and trade control uh, agencies, which, um, which you can see about ninety percent of the uh, ninety percent of countries have made some efforts have have, have at least are in the pilot stage of of implementing these. So these are these are both in terms of full implementation and in terms of engagement in general. The largest, the most progress has been made. When we look at the next group and we look at um, uh, the the specific measures that have um, uh, articles from the WTO's trade trade facilitation agreement. We can see the um, electronic payment of customs duties and fees, which is Article 7.2, um, which at least 80% of countries have piloted. So that we, that's something that's ongoing. And, and of course, the electronic uh, single windows, which has made a, a, quite a bit less progress, um, which is only which is reporting in at um, here at about 75% of countries have, have made some progress, have, have, or at least in the pilot stage, but you can see implementation is still around, full implementation is around 25%. So, and, and, and you can, and, and as you work your way down on the last two, you can see that much more progress is needed, uh, particularly for um, electronic certificates. Of, well, the application issuing of um, certificates of origin, as well as custom refunds. <clears throat> When we look regionally, uh, we can see, so when we look at the regional average of the level of implementation, it shows that um, the Pacific Islands, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia um, all tend to be below the global average, which is in these blue dots. Um, I, I've, I always find this is particularly interesting to look at the, the electronic uh, single window system and see where countries stand. They certainly stand, stand below. Um, 
But the level of implementation by measure, so similar, similar trends as the previous slide, but highlights really that the world um, has, has more work to do. And that's again on, on single windows, as well as on uh, certificates of origin and uh, customs refunds. When we look at the second subgroup, uh, the cross-border trade, uh, this, is, this is looking at cross-border paperless trade. This is looking at the laws and regulations for electronic transactions, as well as the recognized certification authorities, which are really basic building blocks to enable the exchange of, 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 data, of, of trade, electronic trade documents and data, um, as well as additional measures that are really looking at the exchange of, of those specific uh, documents. And here you can see them here on, on, on the left-hand side. Overall, we see that the implementation um, levels of cross-border uh, paperless trade are quite low, um, naturally. So 70% of countries have taken steps um, to, to establish laws and regulations, which is really the first step. Um, uh, about 30% are fully implemented. Um, less than 60% of countries have recognized um, Certification authorities in place, and this this part this explains why um, this par partially explains why some of the full uh, electronic exchange of documents is limited for for things like uh, things like SPS you have here, electronic SPS certificates, um, as well as certificates of origin, so which typically range in the in less than ten percent. Again, by region, we see similar trends by measures uh, in measures by region. So we start here with the Pacific Islands, and it sort of works its way out Sub-Saharan Africa, um, South Asia, and and so on. I think the the, the keynotes the keynote is really Southeast Asia and East, and East Asia, which has made some of the the most progress. Obviously, along with develop, developed economies, um, and, and interesting enough uh, for electronic um, SPS certificates. So, to to just so so the last two slides that I just talk about briefly is 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 um you know how, how we can scale up digital trade facilitation and well and, and what those steps could be. Well, I, and I think as mentioned in the intro, I think it's important to start with the WTO's trade facilitation agreement. Um, it quite interestingly, right? It has very similar objectives as, 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 as digitalization, right? It's, we're looking at um, things like uh, efficiency, uh, transparency, lowering costs, reducing friction, expediting shipments. So the, really the first step is to make sure that, that those procedures are followed uh, because ultimately it's 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 a, it's an it's important first step in, in in achieving digital trade and secondly talk about making a plan seems very basic i know why would i put this but it, it it's this it really requires a political commitment uh, po a political will it's a long journey and you can see that through 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 many countries that 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 start this process and so careful planning i, I should be made in terms of ass assessing investment costs understanding which type of documents you, you, you'd like to move to electronic format, making sure we create, look at opportunities to create economies of scale in, in terms of creating exchange, uh, data exchange systems that, that are, that are multi-use um, and things like that. So it obviously carefully has to be, has to be thought out. This, you know, um, the next step would be on um, updating uh, uh, trade legislation, very important. Um, just here, just quickly mention some great tools um, is the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, great model laws on things like e-signature, electronic transferable records, electronic commerce, really sort of the foundation building blocks. They also have great assessment guides for, for legal readiness. And so I think these are, this is really the building block and really takes a long time and is really quite extensive. Something like FIDO, we, we've you know learned that something like phytosanitary is not just phytosanitary legislation. It, it can move into customs. It can move into IT legislation. It's quite, it, it can be quite, quite cover quite a large uh, area. area. Um, next would be looking at um, simplifying uh, trade facilitation procedures. Um, conducting a business process analysis is really important in terms of understanding already before what is the baseline 
how can what, what types of inefficiencies exist in trade uh, facilitation procedures and how they can be improved and that's an important assessment to do in taking stock as you as you know we work to upgrade upgrade a system obviously building out those the, the, those IT system requirements that are in play that, that are needed to be able to, to, to use that tech, to be able to exchange uh, certificates and, and what what else and, and also thinking about uh, you know how they are can be interoperable with with other systems right I think this is a really important point and, and in a couple in a couple dimensions one is in terms of um, making sure that you know that eFido, uh, electronic single windows and what other systems can can interact with one another, and really I think working in a way to understand what are some of the the basic technology requirements that are needed to to create interoperable systems. I think that's really important to do because you don't want to build systems and then and then be stuck with you know how do we make them interact and have to revise and fix. So I think thinking about that from the beginning is is is, is a key thing to to, to highlight. And probably something that should be done, I think, in a, in a multilateral way, in a collaborative way. Um, last points to mention really quickly are, are obviously, you know, making sure you have stakeholder buy-in, building that business case. We want we want this this, this to benefit users. Um, thinking about things like digital trade standards and rules, a uh, really important up and coming issue, um, and, and not only for you know national governments, but also for the, the, the multilateral, the international community, and, and thinking about what that means as, as this area of, uh, of work uh, evolves. Um, last two things to mention is, is expanding. You know, eFido has been, I, I would say, tremendously successful thus far. Um, and, and it's really, we have to think about how we can um, scale that up to other uh, types of SPS certif certifications, whether it's health, or sanitary certificates, um, and, and as well as building capacity. We want users to be able to use these systems um, and, and, you, and use them actively and, and effectively. And so there's a number of steps that, that, that can be taken uh, in terms of you know, building human capital, you know, education, as well as uh, you know, improving digital infrastructure um, in our ports and, and so on. Thank you very much, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Misha, for this uh, very informative presentation, challenges and opportunities for adoption of digital tools for agri-food trade. I think the, the example you used, uh, they were quite di diver diverse and, uh, and very telling and showing the really the potential of the along the various streams. And then I, I found also your, your presentation on the progress made uh, very interesting, pointing to to some gaps, be it uh, on thematic aspects as well as, of course, on uh, on some geographic uh, progress that are, I would say, to say the least, uneven. And uh, and then, of course, uh, finishing with the, the issues for for adoption and and giving some ideas on how to scale. So thank you very much, Misha, uh, for that. I'm sure there will be questions that will be uh, coming up and. Uh, so we'll get back to you. So uh, I would like now to move to our uh, second uh, presenter today, uh, Miss Nelly Aju. So uh, Nelly, I'm very pleased to, to have you with us today and I'm pleased to give you the floor. So oh, you can see my screen. Yes, very well. But okay, wait, I'm starting your, the, the presenter the mode. mode. Like this. Exactly. Thank okay, you. perfect. So thank you very much for this invitation. I'm feeling very honored to be part of your trade talk today, especially because the trade facilitation agreement accompanies my work uh, since quite a long time and it always comes up again and again. And I often have the feeling that um, if you go away from the multilateral sphere, there's a lot of work to be done also to raise the awareness on the different implication it has um, for different agricultural trade. So. I have um, the honor, Dominic, you introduced me. I think I need to explain it a bit more. And so I'm sharing my time between different uh, roles, which are all kind of interconnected. So as uh, Dominic rightly said, I'm working particularly um, on areas such as customs, border controls, operation, trade facilitation, and of course, digitalization. Um, and I'm sharing my time between Freshfell, which is the European Food and Vegetable Association and based in Brussels. 
Um, and I'm going to come to that in a second with more detail, but I'm at the same time also leading an organization which is called SHAVE, the Southern Hemisphere Association for Fresh Food Exporters, which represents um, the Southern Hemisphere food producing countries, amongst them Argentina, Australia, um, Brazil, Chile, New Zealand, Peru, uh, South Africa, Uruguay, and Zimbabwe just recently joined. Um, and so I'm really having a holistic uh, perspective um, on the global fruit uh, trade uh, evolution at the moment. Additionally, um, I'm also the coordinator of a coalition called Global Produce Coalition, which is trying to address in a common approach uh, current cost hikes and supply chain disruptions. So I would like this um, opportunity to give you a bit of um, overview of um, the sector to date. So where are we right now in the fresh produced food and vegetable trade? And um, what are the current challenges? What we have been basically doing with eFito and um, where we see still main hurdles, what have been the benefits and so on. I also would like to use this momentum um, as well to give um, two or three more points um, to the work agenda, which really would help to facilitate trade in future and where I think this is a good forum um, to share these ideas and these discussions we're having in the sector since a while. So just in a nutshell that you have the housekeeping rules. So Fresh Fresh Europe, European Fresh Produce Association. Um, the beauty of this organization is that we're representing the entire supply chain. So we have producers, growers, traders, importers, exporters. So we have quite a holistic perspective um, in the European market. Um, we look at uh, around about 68 million tons of production, um, an annual turnover of around about 200 billion euros. Um, fresh produce in Europe is mainly traded intra-EU, so uh, we have a lot of turnaround in, in, in the EU 27 countries, but we also export 7.1 million tons to around about 140 destinations and import um, around about 14.5 million tons, which are mainly products which are not necessarily produced in the European Union. For the shave countries, as I said, it's uh, the nine leading southern hemisphere countries, which represent around about 25% of global food trade, um, which is today 12.8 million tons, which are traded globally with a market value of 17.8 billion US dollar. And here with the organization, we're really looking into trade facilitation, but more on the supply chain crisis recently, sustainability and obviously education and training. So why I'm sharing this with you and why didn't I choose one of the organizations is because I would like to give you a bit of a holistic overview where we are right now. Um, uh, the fruit and vegetable industry is a traditionally very, very fragmented industry. So we have 200 origins, we have 200 destinations, and at the spot you have really a very fragmented sector with a lot of participants in the supply chain. So traditionally, this is resulting in a low margin environment um, where a lot of the incomes have to be split along um, the chain and the distribution is often very difficult. Um, we have been doing relatively well, but the pandemic has been challenging our sector massively because obviously we had a lot of um, waiting times at ports, we had um, customs challenges, um, ports in China, for example, are a good example where um, additional customs procedures, control procedures have been delaying the process, and in our case, it is really a perishable product which needs very swift operation to ensure that we're not using the quality of the product that we're not um, endangering food safety um, and these kind of elements and um, a major topic um, in this context is as well the element of sustainability um, sustain sustainability is something the sector is basically um, operating since 20 30 40 years because if we don't preserve our environment we will not be able to produce um, and I think our main challenge is a bit uh, to change the narrative in that regard, because I think we have the beauty of having a product which is healthy, um, which is contributing to public health, and which is at the top of any kind of um, produce which is sustainably produced. So we are spearheading here amongst the agri food commodities. So what we see at the moment is a very, very difficult period. And um, I'm happy Misha uh, mentioned food security. Um, because we've been really running in, we're really ha having a very difficult time with the current supply chain crisis. 
So we see cost hikes, we see increases of container prices around 150 to 400%. We see shipping lines uh, and their reroutings not uh, stopping and ports they used to stop. And um, traders are waiting globally um, on their um, on, on with their product in the ports to, to get picked up. And we see also on the land transport um, an increase of costs. Um, 80% in air freight, uh, we see 100% increase of fertilizer costs um, and 100% in wood pellets and others. So this is just a snapshot. Um, yes, it concerns everyone. Um, I think it's a particularly difficult situation for fruit and vegetables, hence the fragmentation, because there is no global leader, no global leader company, but really um, a sector which is operated everywhere, anywhere, and in any kind of size. So we look today at an increase of 10 billion costs only for 2022 roundabout in Europe, 4, 4 billion roughly only for logistics for Southern Hemisphere exporters and traders. North America, we see cost hikes of around about 25,000% of containers. And in ACP countries, 86% um, of the producers already can feel um, this issue and um, are rethinking currently what how they're going to conduct the business. So I think this is very important to understand um, as a background, because we are in a very difficult situation and we're trying now to coordinate uh, also our ways out because we're working on the self-responsibility of the sector. So as such, um, I had the pleasure to accompany the development of the eFITO hub and the eFITO project since 2015 as a member of the industry advisory group. I have been placing both organization in this industry advisory group because I really believe that we need a global coordination um, from all sides. Um, if we look at the benefits, um, there are clear benefits um, and they have been very clear from the beginning for us. It's a very, very important tool in this very fragmented world um, to go paperless and to have an insured, easy and time uh, transmission and a safe transmission. Um, we had so many occasions, Brexit is just the, the last point, um, where we see that the digital transmission is the only solution to really facilitate in-time trade without any kind of delays. Um, we have been really seeing that during the COVID-19 period, um, there has been really an opening um, amongst the different governments to facilitate the access, um, to use the, to, to really reinforce the usage of the hub um, in order to um, ensure that the phytosanitary certificates are arriving in time from country to country while career services were not working, air freight was not working because what normally is done that the shipments are gone on the water or gone into the truck or the train, um, but the FITO is just sent after with a courier. So um, having had this situation in COVID-19, we really benefited from the eFITO hub um, in easy transmission. However, we see that with the end of the pandemic, I'm not sure if we can call this, but um, there is a wish to, um, return to normal, which um, is ac acceptable and understandable, but where we see that a lot of the trade facilitating measures, which have been actually beneficial for our sector and also for other agricultural industries, have been taken back or taken uh, have been ended um, by slowly phasing out these trade facilitation measures. I'm going to come to this in a second. Um, what we also can see is clearly a cost reduction. So uh, on average, you pay 50, percent, uh, 50 euros for um, a phytosanitary certificate and um, also then for the career services. And this means um, that there a lot of money can be saved um, on the side, especially because we often work with mixed consignments. So one container may have 20 to 50 different phytosanitary certificates, and that is obviously also piling up in money. And of course, um, if we look at um, non-compliances and interceptions, 75% um, of all non-compliances have been resulting in the past from fraudulent or missing certificates. So this is really contributing um, uh, to a reduction of the loss um, through interceptions because we are at least the certification has been cleared. Um, just as a fun fact, so in, in reality, what is happening um, sometimes 
the phyto is handed to the exporter, the exporter is giving it to the captain, the captain is carrying it until he's arriving at the importer and then um, it's cleared at customs. So these are many hands where this is running through. So definitely um, the sector was there from the beginning, very, very excited about this. So our journey um, had two different um, pillars or three different pillars. So basically we have been really trying over the years um, to build advocacy for the system um, at EU level um, in China, in South Africa. So we've been facilitating the contact of the IPPC steering committee, um, the steering committee with the South African NPPO to onboard them and to harmonize their efforts. We have been reaching out with IPPC to China um, and their coordinator to really um, enhance uh, the onboarding in this level. Um, and we have been also working a lot in, at EU level um, to really foster the onboarding of this with the member states. So it was really um, a common effort and we have been doing a lot of advocacy work here. And um, we secondly have been um, doing a lot of um, outreach uh, with the industry advisory group as well as um, on our own for the sector. Um, to really explain what is the system, how the system can be used, um, how people can onboard, how, how this all is working out. And we have been working as well with the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation on these kind of matters. What we see is a, we have a two angle um, issue a bit. Um, so the system is there, it's working, um, but it remains very abstract. So you get a lot of information, 2000 certificates have been exchanged. Um, this has been exchanged. Argentina and the US have been ex are exchanging, um, but it often is unclear who's actually sending it. Um, and we're doing a lot of effort to really put the fruit industry to make use of the system. But there's clearly a gap between public and private sphere. Um, and this is something which we have also seen as a problem with regard um, to conduct case studies, because different than the grain sector, where the importer is the exporter, um, our key challenge was always to find the right connection to do the testing of the system. So we, we, we were always stuck at the point we found an exporter willing to test the system, but then we didn't find, we didn't get the feedback from the importer because all is so small and fragmented um, that the engagement to, to you know, test this and to risk some of the elements is very low. And also, I think there is a, a gap between the, the traders and the NPPOs to really understand and trust each other. So I think traders are sometimes very reluctant to say like, okay, if I don't have the phyto in my hand, uh, I'm a bit worried that's not going to work out. Um, a second big element we saw is that in parallel to this really, really great innovation of this hub, which is um, and really welcomed by the sector, we saw a lot of bilateral um, uh, systems evolving. And that was really contributing to a lot of confusion, um, to a lot of misunderstanding. So is this now e phyto or not? Um, is this, uh, what is this? So we have a connection in the Netherlands with uh, South Africa. We have a connection between Chile and this country. And um, yes, everybody has the right to set this up. But of course, if you really try to, um, to, to connect here the world together and make it easy for everyone, um, we've been really trying to advocate for this one system. Um, thirdly, um, we saw a big problem, um, and we see still a big problem in some of the key trading practices, such as China, that could be really improved, that we have there um, stronger onboarding because there's a lot of trade going there, and it would very much facilitate if this could be doing. And I know that the Chinese colleagues, they're doing a great job now to really um, put all the systems together. And thirdly, um, we had um, a big big, big concern um, with the EU and the TRACES system, because the EU and the TRACES system was the only system uh, where the eFITO hub was integrated, but needed an electronic um, signature to be used. And the implementation of this signature uh, included as well, obviously, an onboarding fee, um, an annual um, maintenance fee, and so on. And um, where we were a bit concerned that this is a bit um, in imbalance with other countries who don't require this e-signature. But the EU has been very, very actively working now to solve the issue and um, to find a solution, at least for the generic systems. Um, so this is um, on the way to be solved. So you see, we've been doing a lot of work on this. Um, 
I, for us, what remains um, as a priority is really to raise the awareness in the sector and to connect public and private sphere. So from our side, this is really a role model um, which needs to be repeated, which can be used also for other certificates and um, a word uh, on single window. Um, yeah, I was always, uh, when I started to work for Freshfell a couple of years ago, I, I thought like the single window uh, in the EU, for example, is already existing. And, and you know, only in the process, I realized, okay, it's still in the building. And I think we need to really get there and simplify processes. I would like to um, take a moment as well um, in this context, because now that I've been sharing this, I've been thinking, OK, um, what, what is it actually what would help us um, and the, the, the sector currently and also in future um, to really avoid um, situations as we are right now, where um, really a lot of industry participants um, are thinking about quitting um, are probably not economic viable anymore. So global, global trading operations. Um, and we've been like really reflecting in the Southern Hemisphere as well in, as in the EU about this. And we realized um, that there's a lot of data available, which is not made available to trade. So we have a lot of customs data, um, which is used for internal purposes, but which, which would be really helpful in a way, um, if you would organize it right, to make good business decision and um, avoid certain food security and price issues we're experiencing at the moment. What we need is basically real-time data. What we have at the moment is at European level, we can look back three months. So we have data from three months um, ago, um, which gives us an indication of trends, but obviously, obviously everything what is real-time is better than um, looking back and um, in the southern hemisphere we do data sharing a week back so we can look back on uh, certain trade flows but looking at the current situation it is very essential that we have real-time access and that we can really use this um, data and analytics as well to make automated uh, business decisions that we can use the predictive machine learning um, tools so to really um, balance a bit where the trade flow is going, a good example, um, when the Ukraine-Russia um, war started, um, some of the traders had uh, some analysis tools and they could reroute their shippings and sell it somewhere else and that secured them their income. And this kind of, um, if this kind of management can be professionalized if we have the customs and real-time port data available in a, uh, in a obviously compliant and non-sensitive matter. That same goes for where are vessels going? Um, where are they at the moment? Um, so that we can do advanced um, planning for shipping, count in the uh, delays, also the transit times, a very difficult topic for us in the food sector because 16 days of transit is something different than 20. Um, and it has always an impact on a very sensitive product. And last but not least, it's also relevant for the entire chain. So it's not just, you know, where do I sell it or where? Um, so if, if five ships go into Australia, I'm going to go to another uh, destination. But it's also relevant for those who harvest because they know, okay, if no ship is coming in the next three weeks, may, I may reorganize my harvest. It's important for cold storage um, and facility management because they need to know at which time they need how much space in their cold storage we need uh, to know this for to port logistics. So how many trucks will be needed at which day? And um, where do we have to stock and where have to do the planning? And of course, as well for the inspections and controls to know what kind of capacity um, is existing. Having said this, um, great efforts have been done on this. Um, but I think there could be a more unified approach to make this accessible. Dominic, I know my time is up. So I have one last remark. Um, I think a second element, and this is something we've been advocating, and I think this is the right for, um, forum as well to make this a bit understood. And we have a second element, and this is um, the whole bunch of um, data available for controls. Um, we have an EU the, uh, IMSOC system, for example. Um, and I think if we would use this data, what we get we could make a much better controlled policy. We could do a much better um, phytosanitary policy 
if we have a more proportional um, overview of what is coming in, where it's done, how it's done. And um, we, we've been actually having a high hope for the IMSOC system doing exactly that, um, realizing it's more an administration tool than an analysis tool. And I think there is a big potential for us to um, enhance the self-responsibility of the trade, to have more predictability and to um, understand the scope of the non-compliances better and to draw the right conclusions in policy, but also in business decisions. And with that, uh, I leave it here. And thank you, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to explain some of the major elements. Thank you so much, uh, Nelly, for such a, a great presentation. We will, of course, make sure that presentations are posted on the website so that participants can can indeed uh, indeed see it. I think it was very interesting to see it also from the angle of your industry, which is, as you say, fragmented and, of course, dealing with highly perishable uh, goods, which makes it uh, even more complex. I think it was interesting to see also that there were some progress that were made even uh, during the COVID time and that there is a risk now of somehow going back and that we need to protect the gains uh, that has been made and built on that because it's also uh, advantages in terms of, uh, of cost. Uh, I think uh, also uh, the, your, your, your final remarks on the, the the, the importance of, uh, of data and real-time uh, data is also uh, very important indeed to support a more uh, sustainable uh, industry. So definitely a very rich presentation. I would like also to invite the presenters to look at the Q&A module because there has been a number of questions that were addressed to them. So you can elect to either respond uh, sort of in plenary or directly uh, type your, your response. So uh, just let me know what you prefer. And uh, now I would like to move to our uh, next, last speaker uh, with Craig. Uh, Craig, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dominique. And uh, I want to say thank you to the FAO for um, inviting me today. Um, I think all of these presentations are quite complimentary and I hope I can add a bit of a different um, but related perspective to uh, what's been said. So my, I have sort of a generic title for my presentation today in, the, uh, in calling it digital trade facilitation, but my subtitle I think kind of relates to the perspective that, that I bring to this, uh, this discussion. And so I've titled the, the subtitle is Agricultural Value Chains, People and Technology, because what I wanna to describe today is how digital trade facilitation really relates to the convergence of everything that happens in a value chain and supply chain for agricultural products. This can be both agri-food as well as other agricultural outputs. Um, people, you know, people are at the core of everything, whether it be the production of the food, whether it be transportation, value addition, uh, et cetera. And then technology and technology is something that um, in terms of uh, agriculture, I've been working in for about a decade now. Um, the, the beginnings of my work in kind of agri-trade space, uh, so to speak, really focusing on reducing uh, waste and loss at earlier stages in the chain. So I'll kind of be integrating my perspectives on agricultural production and value chains into this discussion that's really about uh, trade facilitation and borders. So um, I'll just give a brief overview of, of what I'm gonna speak about today. So at, uh, in the first instance, I'm gonna look at digital trade facilitation in agriculture and kind of provide a bit more of a summary of what's at stake, because I think we really needed to, to define, you know, what are, the, what are the opportunities and what are the, the threats associated with either action or inaction when it comes to implementing trade facilitation uh, measures, uh, especially digital ones. Um, this is a really good segue into actual, uh, the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of implementing measures and, and what that process looks like. I've, I've titled this, uh, this section of the presentation, First Digitize, Then Digitalize. And I will I'll break uh, unpack those uh, terms a little bit more. Um, the third section of the presentation is called From Digital Infrastructure to Digital Tools. 
as I note that um, many in international organizations um, uh, and in general, so to speak, in agricultural and digital trade facilitation are really emphasizing tools, but I think it's really important to take a step back from tools and look at everything that needs to be done from an organizational institutional perspective um, in terms of preparing governments as well as the private sector for digital trade facilitation implementation. And then um, in, the, in the fourth and final section of the presentation, I'm gonna look at um, an area of, that I call pillars of interoperability and the various steps that are required uh, in terms of single window road mapping. We've heard a little bit about single window today, but I will speak more to that. So um, section one, speaking about what's at stake in terms of digital trade facilitation and agriculture. I think this quote um, or this, this uh, research from UNCTAD, which dates back to 1994 actually, is really poignant because I think it illustrates to everyone kind of what we're dealing with when it, when it comes to coordination and different types of document parties uh, and, and uh, data elements that are involved in a trade transactions. So um, the UNCTAD data from 1994 basically states that uh, an average customs transaction involves um, uh, 30 parties, 40 documents, and 200 data elements. And I've described this as forming what you could call a data supply chain, which would be in parallel to the value chain or the supply chain of any product. And in agricultural products or agri trade in agricultural products also involves um, many other additional compliance documents that you would not necessarily find in a non agri trade uh, product. So these can include sanitary and phytosanitary certificates, SPS, which we've spoken a little bit about today, but it could also relate to certificates of origin, et cetera. Um, and, and a lot of what's at stake in, in, in this space is really related to the fact that, uh, and I mentioned that agri-food products are, many are uh, also perishable and they're sensitive to food uh, loss and waste. Um, and so in this space and, and what's at stake here is that digital technologies can help reduce fundamentally coordination problems by helping to reduce uh, friction. These are the time and costs at each stage of a product's value chain as it moves through the chain. And this includes cross-border transactions. Um, and all of these stakes really kind of, they vary by different stakeholders. So it's really important to frame how the stakeholders relate to uh, the various stakes. Um, and these stakeholders can include governments, enterprises of all sizes, and these can be small and formal um, enterprises, and then can be large formal uh, multinational corporations actually, um, that uh, participate in agricultural value chains, as well as global society, because um, everyone is a stakeholder in agriculture. Um, and so to kind of map these, uh, these stakeholder groups onto some of what are the what these stakes are uh, at the at the kind of highest level at the international legal level. Uh, one of the stakes is a legal issue because any government that has committed to um, multilateral agreements such as the trade facilitation agreement or regional agreements such as the African continental free trade area are these governments and these government stakeholders are have made obligations that they will implement on a schedule uh, various commitments related to trade facilitation. So there is a legal dimension of this that I think is important to understand. And, and that's a capacity that relates to government and their and, and more institutional organizational aspects of the stakes at play. There's also a so, huge socioeconomic uh, stake here. And we've touched on this um, with, with the other speakers, but this is something that I think I wanted to reiterate uh, and this, relates all the way to the macro level, talking about national economies, but also really looking at the local livelihoods and, uh, that pertain to um, both trade costs as well as uh, market access. And so this is interesting because when you look at full implementation of digital trade facilitation measures, which I'll speak to in a minute, um, those digital measures that may go beyond the uh, WTO TFA um, could reduce costs, trade costs by as much as 13% versus only 6.7% um, at the minimum TFA um, uh, measures uh, implementation level. So 
that's an important thing to note. There's also massive environmental and biosecurity uh, stakes at play here with regards to digital um, trade facilitation implementation and what could or may happen in terms of formal and informal trade and, and, and the issues that we face with invasive species um, and, and environmental degradation, et cetera. And then there's the more human elements that relate to food safety, human health, food security, and, and humanitarian logistics. So these are the stakes at play. And, and more from a personal note, in a lot of my work that I've done in the past, kind of connecting the area of food losses and waste and the community of practice um, I've been involved with um, with the FAO since 2013. Um, here I've identified three areas in the, in the food supply chain that really relate to where trade and the coordination problems can start to affect the supply and availability of, uh, of, of safe and, uh, and safe food. So um, these issues really start at the post-harvest handling and storage phase and, and storage um, can be involved at different stages in the chain. This can be at value addition stages. Um, and this really then relates to the area in the chain related to processing. Um, and then fourth distribution, which is the most connected to trade and trade facilitation. And um, interestingly enough, um, in Sub-Saharan African countries, it's been estimated that 20% of the food waste and loss occurs at the distribution stage. So anything that trade facilitation can do to reduce that figure um, is very important. And that, that's at a domestic level. So I don't even know if we have the, the distribution um, food uh, loss and waste uh, figure for, for trade. So I also wanted to say a few things here, which I think is really important related to trade facilitation implementation as sort of one component of the overall um, holistic perspective on agri-trade uh, and, and, and sectoral competitiveness, especially in least developed countries that don't already have a lot of these um, components of a holistic uh, agri-trade uh, sector in place. So these are everything from the business environment and the, the strategies that go into designing um, agri-food sectors and agri-trade sectors in general. Um, further along to the areas of trade support and trade facilitation, access to finance, um, because trade facilitation doesn't, doesn't exist in a vacuum. These measures that governments are seeking to enact and, um, and the modernization of their existing systems it doesn't, it doesn't happen without other key services being provided to sectors and to the firms that um, exist in, that, in those sectors. And one of those other key areas further down kind of the chain as enterprises um, become competitive in domestic and international markets is also the access and transfer of technology and skills. So I think it was really important for me to highlight that everything we're talking about in terms of digital and, and trade facilitation in general, it doesn't, doesn't exist on its own. And another key note um, that I think is important before I get into some other areas related to digital trade facilitation implementation is uh, differentiating between the ideas and the concepts of digitization versus digitalization. So digitization really focuses on the conversion of analog sources. So you could talk about paper-based documents into a digital form that's, um, that can be read or processed by a computer. So this is the idea of, sounds a bit redundant, but saying electronic or digital data. This is very different from the idea of digitalization, which is sort of what do you do when you've digitized um, inputs? And digitalization really relates to trans, transforming these inputs, these digital inputs into digital outputs, or at least into intermediate forms that the humans and computers can work with more readily. So the definition of digitalization is the use of digital sources of data or documents um, for process improvement, such as uh, automation. And so section two kind of moves along from looking at these stakes and kind of these ideas and these concepts about digitization and digitalization and really gets into how does this um, converge with the um, implementation process that governments are subject to because of their international obligations, as well as their own needs in terms of improving the competitiveness of agri, of agri trade at, at national, subnational, regional levels, whatever it may be. And so 
Um, I've entitled uh, this section of the presentation, first digitize, then digitalize, because I think that really provides a nice summary of what governments are kind of faced with when it, when it comes to the steps involved with implementing uh, measures for digital trade facilitation. So, um, and, and this is not just something we can say is implementation as a general term. It really needs to be broken down into the, um, the, the different um, uh, the processes and groups of measures that are involved, as well as the stakeholders. So um, the different uh, measures that are at play really relate to everything from enhancing that institutional arrangement and cooperation to establishing transparency mechanisms, implementing um, efficient uh, trade formalities and frameworks for formalities, and the development of paperless trade systems. And this follows a natural progression and, and a building as you move up the so-called ladder from the institutional and, and more organizational aspects to more of the, uh, I would call the technical and the, um, the elements that relate to the underlying requirements for a a cross-border paperless trading system. And I'll get into the definitions of that. And in all of this, you have people and you have stakeholders from various um, entities and organizations. So this can be across government. So government agencies from customs, agriculture, health, et cetera, um, to policymakers that are involved in more of the legislative environment. Um, and it also includes all of the private uh, stakeholders, which we've discussed a little bit about the intersection today between sort of the government side of trade facilitation implementation and the needs of, of industry. So these are everything from the producers to the traders, transportation service providers, banks, insurance companies, consumer groups, and civil society at large. So I also thought it was kind of important if we're talking about the digital uh, measures for trade facilitation, to also kind of define what paperless trade is. So UNESCAP provides a really good uh, definition here. Um, paperless trade can be defined as trade taking place on the basis of uh, electronic communications, including exchange of trade related data and documents in electronic form. And so the development of paperless and cross-border paperless trading systems um, in the cross-border context is really relates to mutual recognition and mechanisms for exchange between governments. Um, and we can call these two groups, paperless and cross-border paperless measures um, as fulfilling that area of uh, digital trade facilitation generally, this all requires a legal technical basis. Um, and it's also important to think about the different variety of measures also relate to different contexts. So these can be um, measures that support business to business um, communications and facilitation. Uh, business to government, which is the classic model, what we would think about in terms of trade facilitation um, or government to business for that matter. And then the area which is becoming more important as we're following that path from the institutional at a internal level towards uh, government level towards paperless uh, measures is the idea of government to government. And this is the idea of cross-border paperless. This can be national coordination within a country between the various agencies, but also communications between national governments. I think that's a critical uh, aspect when we get to some of the discussions that I'll um, bring up around interoperability between systems that are involved in um, uh, paperless trade. So uh, breaking down that area of trade facility, uh, digital trade facilitation more broadly and paperless and uh, cross-border paperless measures, there are numerous different types of measures, and some of these you would consider falling into the scope of the multilateral um, arrangement under the trade facilitation agreement. So as we can see under the paperless uh, measures category, um, e-payment of uh, customs duties and fees is one of the uh, measures for paperless trade that is uh, um, mandated and committed to by members of the WTO, as well as this concept of electronic um, single window system, which I will speak a little bit uh, more to in the coming slides. And then, um, especially related to agriculture at the cross-border paperless measures level, um, the certificate of origin uh, exchange between countries is of a critical importance to note, as well as um, 
SPS certificate exchange between countries. And this is also sort of reflected in some of the agricultural trade facilitation specific measures that are not necessarily digital, although we can see here um, when it comes to electronic application and issuance of SPS certificates. Uh, this has been a category of measure that's been included in the UN Global Survey on Digital and Sustainable Trade Facilitation, as well as um, the importance of special treatment for perishable goods at border crossings, which relates to TFA Article 7.9. Um, and I want to speak a little bit more to we've been we've been mentioning single window systems, but what is a single window system? So single window systems refer to the variety of different systems, platforms and environments um, that exist. And they're not only for trade. Um, they allow parties involved in trade and transport to lodge standardized information and documents within a single entry point to fulfill all import, export and transit related regulatory requirements. And in some contexts, the non-trade single window systems, this can be other types of regulatory requirements or even port systems um, more at the transportation level are focused possibly only on um, aspects that relate to transportation. Um, and this requires that there is some level of uh, communication exchange between the variety of different single window and other more basic uh, systems such as uh, the more basic customs automation systems. Um, and the core thing that really like defines single windows is that if information is electronic, then individual data elements should only be submitted once and into one system. Um, and the advanced uh, examples of these systems and the ones that I've been focusing on in, in some of my work uh, relate to um, the automation of rules and what can be called computational law in some, some spheres. And, uh, that have also full data processing functionality. Um, and here's a little example of a single window system. Um, and it really illustrates how it's not just one system, it's a, a network of networks, so to speak, um, that's typically connected to the internet as well. And each of these systems have to be able to communicate and um, interoperate. And so this is an interesting element of when we're considering the legal aspects and interoperability in those regards between jurisdictions and, and systems, uh, we also, uh, uh, jurisdictions, we also have to think about what is the interoperability between the systems by which these, um, these various governments, uh, th these governments and uh, these actors and in industry use to ensure that we have seamless um, supply chains and communication between all the actors. Um, and so at the third section here in the, of the presentation, I really wanted to like discuss as well as like talking about the idea of and the differentiation between digital infrastructure and digital tools. So everything that we've kind of spoken about today really talks about the idea of institutional formalization and coordination. But all of that, everything that's done in terms of institutions and people must also be reflected in developing a, what we would call a digital public infrastructure. This is the back end and everything from a technical perspective that helps the realization and the opera, operationalization of, of what has been discussed and formalized between people and organizations. And so whether uh, digital tools are developed by the public sector itself, consortia or industry, all these tools are predicated on the existence of backend government, network systems, knowledge infrastructure, et cetera, and the availability of data sources. I think this is a key differentiating point because many times we'll speak about digital tools, but we'll really forget that without infrastructure, there can't be digital tools. And, and another thing as well, which I think is important, which we don't really differentiate very frequently in the trade facilitation space, but I think it's key to kind of always wear this hat and think about the differences between uh, the different types of tools that are predicated by this digital public infrastructure. The first of these tools are trade information tools. And these are the tools that really emphasize market information and decision-making. This is before a transaction ever occurs. And, and I think that these tools are, from what I've seen, um, these are critical for really helping firms understanding what opportunities exist and being able to overcome 
the uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers that exist and getting that information about rules and regulations and, and where to find uh, market information, business intelligence, et cetera. And these are, these are tools that are enshrined also in the trade facilitation agreement under Article 1.2 and access to information. Although it's not, it does not specifically state that they have to be as advanced as a trade information portal. These can be simple websites. So thinking about one class of digital tools, we can think about trade information. But what I think the main conversation, the point of conversation today is focused on trade operations tools. And these are the ones that really focus on tra transactional um, and, and enforcement from the government side and compliance from, uh, from industry and, and actors involved in the in agricultural uh, value chains. And one of the ones that the digital tools in this space, but it sort of blurs the, it kind of blurs between digital infrastructure, so to speak, and digital tools is the idea of the electronic single window system, which I've spoken to. So saying all of that, um, it's important that governments and, 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 and regional um, bodies, as well as the multilateral institutions understand um, and think about the pillars of interoperability between um, digital infrastructure, digital tools, and uh, among these tools, um, and all of the users of these um, of these systems, um, it's important that they think about pillars of interoperability um, at a at a first instance, and how this relates to also the um, road mapping for the deployment. Um, and design of, of, of national single window systems. And so this all really begins at, at the legal framework level. And um, as Misha spoke to earlier, um, this really is critical for, for domestic electronic transaction frameworks and, and various um, frameworks for electronic signatures, uh, documents, electronic commerce to be in place in the first instance. And this is really, at a at a domestic um, level, but it's it's critical for the for the international oper interoperability and the legal interoperability, so to speak. And the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law provides excellent model laws that countries can use as a template to enshrine um, a domestic framework for the uh, that underlies electronic uh, transacting. Um, also, organizational. So the idea of uh, digital identity and legal entities and, and different ways to ensure that there is sufficient um, business uh, recognition of business structures, as well as other um, forms of entities, including government entities. Um, it's also important to look at the semantic um, infrastructure and ways of thinking about um, interoperability. This is the format and meaning, so meaning, so to speak, of inputs uh, that these systems use. So this can relate from everything to the data models and standards of the World Customs Organization and its customs data model uh, to the UNC fact um, messaging standards, etc. The the private OASIS standards for um, digital documents, such as the Universal Business Language and XML formats, and the IP. IP, IPPC uh, eFIDO standards, uh, XML standards for representation of electronic SPS uh, certificates. Um, there's also a technical interoperability aspect that relates to data exchange. Um, a lot of what we're seeing in this space with systems is moving from the, the traditional uh, electronic data interchange approach to more uh, uh, application uh, programming interface um, uh, approaches that are essentially ready for digital tools and enabling kind of what I was talking about before the the move from uh, digital infrastructure digital digital tools and then my last kind of point on um, the pillars of interoperability also relates to kind of that human uh, discovery and accessibility aspect of using these information and communications technologies infrastructure and tools to actually accomplish um, operational operations goals, whether they be sort of at intermediate stages in the chain or they be at that, that true digital trade facilitation stage. Um, and then I'll kind of wrap up my, uh, my presentation here by kind of speaking to everything that's needed to follow 
um, based on some of what I've spoken to you from the from the policy planning stages all all the way to the legal institutional um, frameworks that need to be in place so that this kind of relates to what I mentioned about the UN Citral um, model laws, which um, we've seen more rapid adoption lately in jurisdictions such as uh, Singapore and, and now the UK. Um, the business process analysis aspects that relate more so to looking at the supply chain reference model that's provided by UNCFACT and really understanding like everything from buy, ship and pay, everything that happens with uh, businesses and the processes that they're involved with throughout the supply chain. Um, then this gets moves forward into the areas of document simplification and standardization. This is really where we're getting into digitize before you digitalize um, and then national data harmonization uh, aspects that relate to cross-border data exchange, which um, speaks to the pillars of interoperability and in the areas of uh, the WCO data model, UN XML, but also the private uh, data standards, such as those provided by OASIS. And then lastly, all of these different steps feed into um, national single window implementation. And so the putting in place all the legal technical requirements can allow governments to kind of realize these measures um, as well as their obligations from that, from that legal um, stake that they, they have in all these things. And um, sort of to summarize, what we're really looking at here is not only just agricultural value chains, but the people and the processes and the organizations that need to be combined, combined and converged so that we can have um, successful realization of um, both the objectives of governments and multilateral bodies, but also companies and people that are really trying to uh, navigate these very challenging times. And so I will uh, wrap up um, by saying that I really appreciate everyone's time and to the WTO for inviting, or to the FAO for inviting me today. And, um, and thank you. Um, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions if we have time. Thank you very much, Greg, and thank you indeed for such a comprehensive presentation. Again, we'll make sure it is posted and uh, pointing, of course, to the importance of uh, digitalization for trade facilitation. I think uh, it was very important to have a, a good, very well articulated uh, presentation. Highly appreciate it. Thank you. Time is running, unfortunately. So uh, we, what I propose is that we have one question. There has been quite a few questions that were responded directly, but then what we can have is one question for each of the of the of the presenters today. So I'd like to to go back to to Misha first and ask him, uh, Misha, what is the impact of uh, what do you see as the main impact of digital trade facilitation solutions actually on farmers? Yeah, thanks so much, Dominique. I'll be quick here because I know our time's running out. Oh, I think it really it depends on the digital solution. So there could be there could be multiple avenues that it it can provide benefits. Um, I think for paperless trade, it helps lower lower costs in the supply chain um, from different inefficiencies, as we've discussed, um, and which ultimately affect, can affect a uh, farmer's bottom line. It can you know infect the. Uh, have a, have a, have an impact on their income. Um, I think when you look at things like um, um, the open account trade finance, which accounts for the vast majority of trade finance, which is pretty essential to uh, to, to 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 participate in international markets. Um, ultimately, which for those that don't know, it, it's basically in favor of the importer. So the, the the producer, the exporter, whoever's sending the goods are paid once those goods are received. So there's a long payment terms and a lot of waiting. And ultimately, um, greater efficiency, a quicker delivery of goods means that they're able to be paid quicker and have uh, be able to better manage their business. And so um, I, I think these are, these are some of the, the ways that I think about it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Misha. And again, thanks again. Uh, thanks a lot for participating. Uh, going to Nelly now. In your presentation, Nelly, you, you spoke a lot of the importance of, uh, of real-time uh, data availability. But can you tell us what you see as some of the key challenges in making such uh, real-time data available? I mean, briefly. 
That's a very good it's question. <laughs> it's a very good question. I think it's um. I so I, first of all, I'm not a technical expert. I see. Um, I think we have a complexity of global movements. So grasping that in one system technically will be probably a challenge. Um, and I think the way I think we should also be very realistic about how people can read data. And um, let me refer back to Eurostat. If you look at Eurostat. It's very difficult to read it if you don't have a kind of a tool which is making the analysis for you. And here, um, what I see is that there are smart people who are trying um, to make a business out of it. So they have cooperation with customs. They build these data into their own solutions and sell it. Um, but I think this is something, if the data is public, it should be accessible for everyone. So it should be a common um, project and I always find it difficult then to buy the solution from one versus another so it's always better if the solution is developed from the inside okay thanks thanks that's I hope great. that no, that's, clear. <laughs> that's clear thank you thank you and then finally Greg uh, in a few words uh, what do you say uh, some of the stakes for implementation of measures for digital trade facilitation in the context the specific context of the agriculture sector well, yeah, I, and I think I think Nelly really touched on on something that's critical there is that what we're seeing is a lot of fragmentation. So what I would say that in broad terms, the and I, I apologize for speaking a little bit too long, but I'm quite passionate about this topic. We could see that. that I, <laughs> I think avoiding the fragmentation problem is the is the critical um, is the critical uh, thing to consider for everyone who's working on different aspects of this very multi-layered, uh, multiple uh, stakeholder problem. So I would say just trying to avoid uh, fragmentation and focusing on inherent interoperability. I don't see any problem with private um, entities being involved in developing solutions, but if they do, it should be that they create mechanisms by which other people can pick up and, and use what they're doing. So I'm a big advocate for open source solutions. And that would be sort of my summary. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. And again, I would like to thank uh, Misha, Nelly, and Craig for their presentation. Of course, this is a very big topic. And uh, as you all know, uh, digitalization is, is really uh, a key priority for, for FAO in the, in the broad sense. And, uh, and, and it is actually one of the accelerator of the FAO strategic framework. And therefore, we will be uh, for sure coming back uh, to this topic in the in the coming month and in the com coming events of this series of uh, agricultural trade talk and even fisheries trade talk. Uh, so uh, rest assured, it, this, we will come back and call again on our on our speakers. Uh, but before closing the, the event, of course, I would like to uh, to reiterate the, the appreciation for, for the participation of the speakers, of course, of, of all the participants and for their engagement. They were quite a number of very good questions that, that, that came in that way, that were, I hope, uh, answered to your satisfaction. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are continuing the, the series of agriculture talks. We'll try to keep the, the momentum of one event uh, per month. And uh, the next event in that respect will take place in July and we'll very soon send out invitation and, and make sure that you can, can be on, on your agenda. So uh, for, with that, I wish you all a very good rest of the day and hope you, hope you found this, uh, this session interesting. And again, thank you and see you all very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.